In this video, we'll look at considerations for analyzing projectile motion. Well, we've actually seen projectile motion already when we looked at the example of a tennis ball in the uniform motion video. And we saw these motion graphs where the position time curve had a changing slope that reverses direction and a velocity time curve with a uniformly negative slope, indicating a negative acceleration. But remember in the last video when I said there's a relationship between force and acceleration? There's also a link between the force of the fan and the acceleration, but we'll explore this in a later video. See? I did say that. Mm -hmm. Let's look more closely at that velocity time curve. Even though the ball moved up for about the first quarter second and down for the same amount of time, notice that the slope which tells us the acceleration is uniform throughout the flight. Interestingly enough, objects generally, with a few exceptions, fall with this uniform acceleration. Here's an example of a coffee filter crumpled into a tight ball falling from rest. Before we go further with the analysis, pause the video and write down your prediction for how the velocity time curve will look. <laughs> Using the Logger Pro software, we measured the velocity as it fell. Now, while the initial velocity for the filter was zero compared to 2.4 meters per second upward for the tennis ball, compare the slopes of the two velocity time curves. They're almost identical. So not only does the acceleration remain constant for the tennis ball as it does for the coffee filter, but the acceleration is the same for both. And the person most commonly associated with this discovery was Galileo Galilei. Although there's no record of him doing this, he's often associated with dropping cannonballs from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. This constant acceleration that Galileo discovered came to be known as the law of falling bodies. And like we mentioned in the last video, this acceleration is due to a force, and we know this force as gravity. Now we'll discuss forces, and in particular gravity, in a later video. But for now though, we'll consider this acceleration constant and use the accepted value of 9.8 meters per second squared in the downward direction. And we should be aware of conditions where this law is not obeyed. Watch this video with the same coffee filter before we crumpled it up. Again, pause the video and predict what we'll measure. <laughs> Now here the open filter doesn't appear to obey Galileo's law. That's because although we can't see it, and the interaction is relatively weak, the filter is falling through air. If enough of the air can impede the motion of the filter with a force that equals the force of gravity, an object reaches what's known as its terminal velocity. That is, it hits a maximum speed where it remains for the rest of its flight. Skydivers take advantage of this when they use parachutes. While the physics of this phenomenon are beyond the scope of this course, it's important to recognize the limits of our understanding. Note there's an interesting point where the physics conditions change. The coffee filter flips and adjusts its terminal velocity. The speed is fairly uniform before the flip and then travels at a higher but still rather uniform terminal velocity. And one of the coolest demonstrations of falling bodies overcoming this terminal velocity was performed by Commander David Scott on the Apollo 15 mission, where he dropped a hammer and feather on the moon which has no atmosphere to slow it down. This film is sped up for our video. You can check out this footage on YouTube. Just follow the link in the description below. Now remember that acceleration is a vector and direction is critical. A couple of simple checks. Drop your pen or some other object and note the direction it falls. Directly down. In fact, gravity defines the vertical direction. Of course, it also indirectly defines the horizontal as this is a direction perpendicular to the acceleration due to gravity. And this becomes important when we look at objects thrown in a direction other than vertical. Since velocity is a vector, remember that we can resolve any velocity into components on a Cartesian plane or XY grid. Luckily for us, this maps directly to our horizontal and vertical directions. And since gravity only acts in our vertical or Y direction, a projectile only accelerates vertically. And if there's no acceleration in our horizontal or X direction, when we analyze this motion, it should be uniform. Well, let's look at this roll of tape being tossed in a non-vertical direction and see if we can't use some of our kinematics knowledge to determine its launch velocity. Since we expect different types of motion in the x and y directions, let's look at our position time graphs for each of these. First, the y direction. No surprise, we've seen this shape before. And for the x direction, as we suspected, the motion appears to be uniform, but it's moving in the negative direction. The Logger Pro software assumes the x direction to the right and the y direction upward both to be positive. So let's look at the information we have to work with to determine our launch velocity. Well, we can determine the maximum height the tape reaches from the graph. Measuring the vertical grid, the lines are separated by 23 millimeters, and the peak of the graph is 14.5 millimeters above the 0.7 meter grid line. So, multiplying the ratio of the trend line distance in the grid to the height of the grid by the value of the grid spacing, and adding 0.7 meters below the grid line, we get 0.763 meters as our maximum height. And for the time axis, the grid spacing is 45 millimeters, and the peak occurs at a distance of 26 millimeters from the 0.3 second grid line. Using the same calculation strategy as we did with the height, we find the tape reaches the peak of its trajectory 0.358 seconds after launch. So we have the maximum vertical displacement and the time when this occurs, and we have gravity causing a downward acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. What if we use that second equation we found in the last video and rearrange the expression to solve for the initial velocity in the y direction? 
So plugging in the values we measured, we find an initial vertical velocity of 3.89 meters per second upward. But we can't forget our uniform horizontal velocity. For this, we'll find the time of 0.358 seconds on our position time graph for the x direction. Since the horizontal grid spacing here is also 45 millimeters, we'll need a time location that's 26 millimeters past the 0.3 second grid line. At this point, our trend line is 5.5 millimeters below the negative 0.6 meter grid line. Now the vertical spacing on this grid is different from our y direction graph. Here the grid lines are 27.5 millimeters apart for each 0.2 meters. So the calculation strategy is the same but the numbers are unique for every graph. And we find that the tape travels 0.64 meters to the left when it reaches the vertical peak. Now using our uniform motion equation we find the velocity in the x direction is 1.79 meters per second to the left. So our launch velocity is the vector sum of these velocities in the x and y direction. Using Pythagoras we find the magnitude is 4.28 meters per second. While using trigonometry we find the angle is 65.3 degrees above the horizontal. Please note this two-dimensional direction notation. The way to read this direction is to start aiming in one dimension, in this case to the left along the horizontal. Then rotate an angle, 65 degrees here, in the second dimension. In this case we rotate vertically upward. There are a number of ways to designate these two-dimensional headings. We'll discuss the others as they come up.